And he comes running in the office one day and he's waving his keys in the air like this. And he's like, thank you so much for the opportunity to work for you. I just bought my first house. And, and to me, that was one of those moments where it was like, you know what, this is what it's really about. And, you know, and I, don't, I can't even honestly tell you if I even owned my own home at that point. Welcome to Beyond Clean with Ace. In the world of commercial cleaning, newcomers and seasoned professionals know we're more than just toilets, windows, and floors. We're just like everyone else with diverse interests in everything. And over the past seven seasons, tens of thousands have discovered engaging, thoughtful, and truly game-changing knowledge here. Whether you're a facility manager, a frontline staff member, or a building services contractor, we're here to help you grow both personally and professionally. So hit that subscribe button and share with others because we're all about enhancing lives in healthy, positive, and proactive ways. Now let's join Dave Thompson, director of the Academy of Cleaning Excellence, your host here at Beyond Clean with ACE. Well, everyone, you have joined me for another episode of Beyond Clean with Ace, where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the cleaning industry and probably some things that don't even have to do with the cleaning industry, because that's why we called it Beyond Clean. You know, we do more than clean toilets, wash windows and scrub floors. And the nice thing about a podcast on YouTube or the audio, whichever way you're watching today, ha, we can travel anywhere we want to. Right now, I'm going to travel somewhere over in another southern state. Uh, you know, and sometimes they say you're not quite as southern as we are, because I think over in Texas, there is this thing about a southern draw. I've Dan, heard is that. that. True? Is that true? <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> do, do you think you have a southern draw? I've been working on it. I got, let's see, I got to Texas in 97, and I've been working on it ever since. What, creating one or, or <laughs> just trying to get as close as I can. <laughs> so Dan, you and I met on the internet on LinkedIn, uh, you know, like some of what you were posting up there and said, Hey, let's get on the show. And here we are. So tell everybody who you are, Dan, and what you do. And what are we going to talk about today? Man, I have no idea. So yeah, uh, <laughs> my name is uh, Dan Schindler. I'm with Integrity Facility Solutions. I'm the CEO of this uh, wonderful organization. We are based out of Dallas, Texas. Um, currently, we are located in about 20 states nationwide. We're uh, trying to expand as rapidly as we can. And so we have offices here in Dallas. We have a location and a physical office in Shreveport and Kingman, Arizona. And then we have a presence in, like I said, 20 other different states. So I've uh, been in the industry for a really long time. I actually started in the industry when I was 12 years old. Uh, and so, yeah, I've been around the block a few times. Yeah, well, you've got a little bit more hair up there. It hasn't quite taken years away from you yet. All that, all that stress hasn't pulled it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, Dan, you know, I think it's interesting as I talk with different people in the industry, um, there are a number of us. And as you said, 12, I started at 14. I got a little head start on you, though, I think. Um, <laughs> But I, I, you know, I was just interviewing another guy and he said, I don't know what else to do. You, so, say, you, think, you think that's the same way for you? Well, I actually have kind of a different story. I was in the janitorial from age 12. And then at age 19, I was doing everything I could do to get out of the business. <laughs> and so, so I, uh, I actually pursued a career in aviation. I went to flight school, got all of my ratings uh, and left the janitorial business from about 96 to about 2001, 2002. Uh, but it kept calling me back. I would be, uh, I'd be on my routes flying. We actually did UPS feeder routes. I was flying Cessna caravans. And uh, I'd set the autopilot and start reading books on how to build business and entrepreneurialism. And so uh, janitorial called me back. And then, you know, after the unfortunate events of September 11th, uh, they, you know, that hit that impacted aviation pretty dramatically. Uh, and, and so it was it was that time that I decided shortly thereafter that it was time for me to, you know, 
hang up my hat, so to speak, in the aviation world and uh, called my wife and said, hey, I just quit my job and we're going to start a janitorial company. And she, <laughs> <laughs> and I would so, love to hear the recording of that. <laughs> yeah, she's like, have you lost your mind, you know? So, no, but, are, you, are you sure you're not breathing in the helium way up there? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So she gave me the, the great opportunity to entrusted me enough to let me do that, let me quit my job. And it was, it was long, hard weekends, you know, it was the family and me and her. And at the time our daughter was like 11 or 12 and we'd spend, you know, we'd spend all weekend long stripping and waxing floors. And then, you know, Monday through Friday, cleaning buildings. It was, it was pretty, you know, pretty gruesome, but I, I just, I had some goals that I was trying to reach. And so, you know, reaching those goals was like, first and foremost, the first goal we set was to get her out of her day job, uh, which we really did in that first year or so. Uh, and now, so now, folks, as Dan's talking, if you're watching the video, I just had to throw this picture up because it's Dan and his wife. So you can just kind of get a picture of that lady there that he had to tell that to. <laughs> and, then, and, she, and then you had to convince her to actually start cleaning with you. Yeah, and she was all in. You know, she's a pretty strong te uh, East Texas girl. So, you know, she's she's born and bred uh, Texas. So, yeah, she jumped right in there and, and was, you know, moving furniture. And, you know, back in those days, the customers didn't do anything. So we had to clear out all the buildings. <laughs> and, you know, we'd clear it. We'd take – it was funny because it was way back before digital cameras. And so we would oh, yeah. take – we would take pictures of all of the rooms that, and uh, we prided ourselves in. We'd go home after we'd worked a long, hard day and we'd print off all the pictures and then we'd come back and we'd set up the rooms. Like I remember, you know, there was a fire truck here. It was a daycare center. So there was like a little toy fire truck and there was all these different things. And, you know, we'd sit back and look at the picture and then we'd go look at the room. We're like, okay, we got every piece of, you know, our goal was when we stripped and waxed the floor that the only thing they noticed with the floor was done, but all the furniture was exactly the way it was when they left on Friday. And so, but yeah, we took all the time to print them off and all that. I'm like, we had, we had no idea. So, but it was, it was good times. And people think the cleaning industry is just cleaning, but see, you just put in another aspect of that, Dan, that makes a professional service different than just somebody grabbing a mop and a broom and doing it. Uh, a professional pays attention to those details. They never ask you to do that, but they became expected of that. Yes. Yeah. Well, and you know, it was funny because the other day I was on Facebook and I was watching just somebody had either posted a reel or a short video on Facebook and they were stripping a floor and they, they had left the tables in the middle of the room. There was, you know, water was splashing all over the chair legs on the tables. And, and I just thought to myself, this is not how this is done. You know, it's the professional side of it, as you said, is, is going that extra step and just making it look perfect and not splashing stuff all over the walls and chair legs and all that good stuff. Dan, it sounds like the reason you and I connected was because we're on LinkedIn, because I looked at a picture today and it was a manufacturer showing them doing a gym floor. And this guy was running a floor machine and he's got the cord wrapped around his neck. <laughs> and I, ha I had to post on there, why are we still showing pictures and training people to do this? The guy did reply. I have to give him credit. <laughs> We're trying to break you of the whole old school habits. We're almost there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think this, this does go to the point you make, Dan. Pictures do speak words, and what we do, those details do matter. Yeah, they do 100%. You know, I attribute my success today to the details that I did 20 years ago. You know, it's those little stepping stones that. You only notice when you look back. You don't see them when you're doing them, but when you look back, you're like, wow, all of those little steps got me to where I am today. And it was just that consistency and that professionalism that, you know, pushed us up. And, and now we're here. Here we are today. 20 states. Um, I imagine she's still in it with you. Actually, she uh, I guess you could say retired about three years ago. Uh, she decided uh, we were sitting down and I said, you know what, you've, you've followed my passion for the last 20 years. You know, what do you, what do you want to do? And she said, I've always had a passion for hospitality. 
Um, and so she's, she's our CHO here, uh, part-time. We call her the chief hospitality officer. Now she was the CFO, uh, up until three years ago. And so we actually started a little Airbnb business where we have some cabins in the woods and they're listed on the Airbnb app. And so she's been doing that. And her dream now is to uh, have an event center with, that she can do weddings and things like that. And so now it's kind of like the first chapter, the first season of our life. We were all about the janitorial and building, you know, IFS. And, and now she has an opportunity to go fulfill her dreams. And so it's been a, it's just a really neat, neat thing for us to be able to do that. You know, so many people think getting into janitorial is a dead end career, but you're not doing that. It is anything from a dead end career. I mean, it's it's. Uh, let me tell you a quick story about what. So when we first started, I went to church with this guy, and he was doing about twelve thousand a month. And at the time, I'm I was doing maybe a couple thousand just cleaning buildings myself. And I remember sitting in church and looking across at him and saying to myself, "Man, if I could ever get to twelve thousand dollars a month, wouldn't that be amazing?" And <laughs> then, yeah, and then we got uh, you know a few, not even probably about two years later, we hit our first million. And then I really had that mindset of like, wow, I've arrived. Like we're at a million dollars a year in revenue. Like, oh my goodness, this was back in 2005, 2006. And so, you know, I was just like, wow, you know, this is amazing. And so I literally took two years off because I was like, there's no, there's nothing more to this business. I, you know, I built an airplane. I worked in my hangar. I just did all these different things. And, uh, then one day I just woke up and realized like, wow, there's way more potential to this business. And ironically enough, I was inspired by uh, Janet King, Jim Cavanaugh over there at Janet King, because here in Addison, he's got a flight museum. And uh, so I was actually going through his flight museum one day and I, was, and I started, you know, researching like, what is Janet King doing? And I think at the time they were doing about 120 million a year. And I just, I just suddenly realized, wow, there is so much potential to this business. And then it was game on after that. We just kept trying to, you know, beat our revenue markers and set bigger goals and, you know, just kept moving and moving and moving. So yeah, this, this business has endless potential. You know, interestingly enough, and I was, to, I, it, it happens with almost every uh, guest that I have on the show of a career that we do it, we leave, we come back. Uh, I had a mentor that told me that, <coughs> excuse me, he, he said, you know, the thing about it is, is that once you've been in the cleaning business, it has a tendency to not let go. <laughs> it is. It's a, a bad fungus, I guess. <laughs> well, I, don't, I'm not, I mean, what's bad about it? It, 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 it just, it, it, it's always there. It's always sustainable. Well, and if you look back at like 2008, 2009, when everybody else was going out of business, you know, <laughs> we, we, we dropped about $20,000 a month in, in revenue, you know, during that period of time. And then, you know, we made it through that, I guess you could call a recession and we came out the other side strong. And then 2019, again, we had, you know, beginning of 2020 when we had COVID, you know, uh, I remember when they started shutting down Dallas County, everybody was in a panic and I lost, I think, 43 customers overnight when COVID hit. And so I panicked too. I started like telling all my employees, hey, everybody's going part time. I, and then next thing I know, you know, the, the whole industry flipped over on its head and we were doing COVID spraying and we were, you know, next, you know, I had one customer that basically dropped $100,000 a month worth of COVID springs in our lap. And so the next thing I know, and so if you look at all of these different cycles in the economy and all that, the cleaning industry is always, you know, the business itself is always very consistent. I think the direct result of failure in our industry usually comes down to management or bad decisions. You know, the times I've seen janitorial companies go under, it's when, you know, the people that own the business overspend their means or they, you know, they don't put money away to make the payroll or different, you know, just basic business management decisions are wrong and it doesn't have anything to do with the industry. Right. And, and, and that's entrepreneurship. That isn't the cleaning industry specific. Right. Um, but I think what you're saying there though, Dan is very true for a number of people that I talk with. And that is the fact that every time there is a recession, just like everybody else, we have that hiccup, but then what seems to happen is we make it through it stronger than what we went into it actually. 
um, you've come out, we've come out of the COVID era right now. Are you stronger than what you went into it in 19? Oh, I'm six times stronger. Yeah. I mean, our, 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 yeah, we're, we're amazingly stronger. And, you know, you would even think in the, you know, the, the trends that worried me the most during that period of time was multi-tenant space, you know, your high rise facilities and, you know, all these companies doing the work from home model and occupancy rates getting below 50%. And so you, you look at all those things and you try to follow the trends. And then now we're starting to see the uptick again, where, you know, the, I think corporations are realizing that the work from home model is not working as well as they thought the productivity is not where it needs to be or should be. And so now we're starting to see the buildings fill back up. They're getting back into the 70, 80. I even have some buildings that are like 95%, you know, occupancy rates. And so you can look at those and just follow the trend. But yeah, we're revenue wise, customer wise, we're six times stronger than we were in 2019. You know, as you say that, though, just like what you and I are doing right here with podcasts, uh, it's easier for me to podcast with people now doing this. My remote learning that I was fighting to try to get people to do remote learning. Everybody said, ah, no, no, yeah, just for... Now it's like, do you have it? You sure you don't have it? And, right. and you know, so <laughs> yeah, and we're getting back to the in-person stuff along with now this. So uh, you know, it's it's uh, for me. I will have to agree with you. You know, I was ready for it with the online. Uh, we had that. Then the remote. I was trying to get people to do it. Now it's like, can you do both at the same time? Uh huh. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we were into Zoom meetings long. I mean, years ago, like we had, you know, we had an office in Baltimore, Maryland. And so we did our daily Zoom powwows. And so, you know, our team was very adapted to already doing, you know, multiple Zoom meetings a week. You know, now, like today alone, I think I've been on seven or eight, you know, different Zoom meetings. And so it's just it's the norm in our culture now. And it's the way to do business. It's it's actually preferred because you can get a meeting done and get moved on to the next meeting and you don't have to drive. You don't have to do all the things that, you know, kill hours in your day. So has this technology dribbled down? I mean, you know, I, I've looked at your website. Uh, so folks, uh, you know, hey, I'm a little ahead of you. I looked at through the website some uh, technology in our frontline staff has to be integrated together if you uh, by my estimation. Technology is definitely a big piece. You know, early on, we, we I mean, again, we, I feel like as an organization, we were ahead of technology. You know, we had proprietary forms. I'll, I'll use the word forms because it wasn't quite apps yet. Uh, you know, we had PDF fill forms on iPads that we were using long, long, long time ago. And then we transitioned that into, we, you know, we, we have, I would say, at least 25 different forms in our own proprietary app. And so we're basically a completely 100% paperless business at this point. Everything we do from our inspections to our client acquisition, all, I mean, all the way through, it either is involved in a CRM or it has, you know, a piece of our proprietary forms that we use. And so, yeah, digital in our industry or, you know, technology is, I was just telling my team the other day, you know, where we win in this business is to stay ahead, to, to be the trendsetter, to try to figure out like from a technology perspective or, you know, what do we got to do to be, you know, the next thing that I'm looking at is, you know, AI with, with, you know, everything that Elon Musk is putting together with his robots and, you know, and I'm not talking about, you know, I went to the ISSA uh, trade show over the weekend, this past week. And there was a lot of those Roomba looking vacuum cleaners that are quote unquote commercial grade level. And, you know, I started asking a bunch of questions and I'm like, this is not the direction technology is going to go in our industry. You know, I believe and hopefully in my lifetime that the Elon Musk's of the world are going to create humanoid style robots that are going to actually do the, you know, at least some level of cleaning. I don't think you could ever take the human element out of it. No. Uh, but at least some level of, you know, some of the mundane tasks that, you know, can be, quote unquote, very robotic. Uh, and so I feel like in our industry that technology is a big piece of it. and We have to stay in front of it, you know, and as industry leaders, we just have to continue to press ahead and try new things. And is everything going to work? No. You know, but you find those customers, you know, I could think of a handful of my own customers. If I walked in and said, hey, we want to try this robot platform and you're in your facility, they would, you know, jump all over it uh, just because, you know, there's the early adopters that want to 
try new stuff. And so, you know, I think technology definitely has a big piece in our industry. You know, I saw one of the new auto scrubbers. I mean, robotic auto scrubbers have been around for probably 30 years uh, while they're always getting better. And I agree. Um, but I also saw one now that not only goes back to the charging station, but it empties itself and fills itself plus the charging. Uh, so basically all that a technician has to do is change the pads and uh, check the squeegee. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's quite an advancement from where we were with the machine that just went around the room and we had to do everything else. <laughs> right. Well, and, there, and then you're running into walls. Like I saw some of the machines that had laser trackers on them and, you know, they'd get up to about an inch to the wall and turn around. And one of the booths I went to, I kept asking the guy, I'm like, are you, you know, do these run into the wall? Because I know the one at my house. It tears up. It tears up the baseboard. It grabs the blanket off the couch. You know all these different yeah. things. And so I, I, I think that laser technology on some of those is definitely going to help for sure. Well, and I, and I think that's the whole thing. And now you mentioned AI, and you know everybody's scared. Yeah, everybody goes ah AI. But you know if you've been using a cell phone since two thousand, you've been using AI in your hand. Yep. And they're they're listening and tracking everything you're saying. So it's well, every time that you, you write start to write a sentence and it finishes it for you, that's AI. Yep. And then now you got the chat bots and all the other things that they got going on. Yeah, it's crazy. We've got we've got a new uh, training platform that we're using. Uh, we're developing some training videos and things like that where you can go into a program and actually watch training modules. And when, as we're setting those up, they have AI on there that literally you, it asks you four questions, what you're trying to accomplish, and it completely writes all the material for you. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen, but that's the direction we're going. You know, pretty soon when you get a text from your wife or your friend, you're not even going to know if they're the ones that even wrote it. You know, it's just, it's the way, way we're moving. Well, and, and I think that is where we're talking about the cleaning industry. People, you know, put it down at that low rung entry level. And while it may always be there, it's not the cleaning professional of, of, uh, of my past. Right, right. No doubt about it. It's funny you say that because I was, I just for fun the other day, I just Googled, like, what are the best businesses to become a millionaire? And cleaning was number eight on the list. The cleaning business was number eight on the list. And it was like, you know, accountants, engineers, lawyers, and then cleaning business was just kind of there all by itself. And I just chuckled a little bit because I was like, it was actually kind of cool to see that. And I think it was like Inc. Magazine or one of those. It was actually kind of cool to see that that someone out there in that in that world recognized what our industry is. Well, I saw a report. This has been a couple of years ago now, Dan, uh, that um, was the large or the fastest growing businesses in America. And we were number six wow. at the time. And the only other ones ahead of us were all healthcare related businesses. Yeah, and and those my, are... my point when I talk to somebody that says, but folks, we're in the healthcare business. We save people's lives before they die. We they don't are. get ill if we do our job right. That's 100% true. I think I saw the other day that we're at a $55 billion industry. I mean, you just think about that. That's crazy. And you're trying to get your billion out of it, right? Right. <laughs> 100%. So uh, 20 states, how long did it take you to get there? So we are fortunate to where we had one customer that kind of drug us into all those states. And so we, we have a really unique ability to recruit individuals to work for us. And so they were very challenged in some rural areas, like I'm talking in the middle of nowhere, you know, population town of 1500 people. And so our team just found a little niche. In fact, they gave the original contract to, and I won't say their name, but a, a big, very well-known nationwide property management firm. And they sat on the business for six months and couldn't find one crew to fill the locations. And so by the time we got these buildings, some of them had been sitting for nearly six months and had no cleaning whatsoever. Oh other, than, other than the employees, you know, what little bit they would be willing to do. But yeah, so uh, and then as we 
you know, the markets like Shreveport, we, we're a pretty big competitor in the Shreveport, Louisiana market. Uh, we started that one from complete scratch. Um, it was close enough to Dallas. It's about a two hour drive. Right. And so that was like, okay, let's go hit a market that, you know, you won't see the big players in that town for the most part, you know? And so we've been able, there's a little mom and pop that's been there since 1963. And we've been able to get in there and, you know, put a little bit of a punch to their market, so to speak. So, uh, and then, you know, the other, other kind of just organically grown into these states with customers that have said, you know, hey, I need a building clean. We never say no to anybody. So if, you know, you call me and say you've got a job in Phoenix, Arizona, we're going to figure out how to make it happen. And our business model allows us to do that uh, since we use the subcontract model. It really allows us to expand and grow at the level that our client base or our sales team, whatever, you know, whatever they bring to the table, we can make it happen. Challenges are different today than they were 20 years ago when the two of you started, right? Oh, yes. 100 percent. I would, you know, I would say that it's a lot more competitive. Um, the uh, ironically, we were just kind of joking, not joking in our morning meeting this morning and you know, the prices that we're getting on certain certain pieces of the market are the same that they were in 1985, you know. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, as competition increases because, it, you know, the cost of entry in our business is next to nothing. You know, you can buy a, a backpack vacuum cleaner and a mop bucket and a broom and you can get into the business. And so that, that tends to hurt our pricing and so you know that's that's a, probably one of the biggest challenges with post covid you know the demand for hourly rates is going up as as most everybody knows you know you can't you can't get a minimum wage worker that's going to do a decent job for you you got to pay decent wages to you know like our day porters and our night crews they're just not willing to work but then on the flip side of that the customers are not willing to pay and so it's just this constant balance of trying to get a customer to pay to get the job done, but to pay your people what they're worth so that the job can get done properly. And that's business management. That is business management 101 right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and still the biggest challenge for most, uh, since you use a subcontract model, uh, I would say the employment battle is not quite what it might be otherwise. Yeah, I mean, all of our internal staff are obviously employees, our operations team, our sales team, you know, all of our direct hire stuff, you know, and so we have heavy reliance on, you know, what we call, we call them ICs, independent contractors, but we have heavy reliance on those teams. Uh, we have some pretty big organizations that are subcontractors that work for us and, you know, they have that, they have the heavy burden of, you know, onboarding the new employees, all the crew members and things like that. But we do also a steady recruiting on our side, especially when we're in, you know, the other states and things like that. We actually have our own subcontractor Facebook group so that we interact with, with those, you know, with everybody on that group. Uh, we post available jobs in that group. And so, you know, there is a, a, a bit of re a recruiting on our side in order to try to bring all of those in to match the growth levels that we're doing. So where do you go from here? I'm trying to get to the hundred million dollars. That's my next stop. Okay. So, you know, uh, we're, we're just working strategy. Like, so every year we do town hall. So, you know, every year we launch. So kind of this, this season between now and the first of the year is our planning season where we put together our town hall event. We're actually going to have the January the 19th open to anybody and everybody that's interested in partnering up with us and becoming a subcontractor. So we're going to have subcontractor day where we, we basically present the team. We present the goals for the year. Uh, and then bring the team together. You know, we do some team building things, some, you know, fun exercises, things like that. Uh, but, you know, for me, it's just, I love the business. Uh, you know, my wife and I are empty nesters now. All of our kids are grown and out of the house. And so the, the challenge for me now is just to continue to grow the business. And it's really not even about the monetary value of it now. It's really about the, just really, you know, reaching back and helping people grow their businesses uh, one of the things I love about the subcontract model is the ability to help people build their dreams. And so we actually have an acronym in our office and it's not hanging on the wall in here, but it's it's called DISH. 
And so our culture as an organization is first we we're dream builders. We inspire others. And then we leave, we lead with a servant leader attitude. And then the way we want to end the race is honest and honorable. And so those are kind of the things that we really focus on. And so next step for me is to really help anybody and everybody build their dream. I, I love, you know, mentoring people that are just getting started in the business, trying to help them, you know, maybe not have to go through the hard roads that I had to go through early on. You know, if I can give them one little nugget or one little piece of information that that helps them and excels their business, then for me, that's what it's really about. And so that that's kind of next step for me. We want to get to the hundred million plus, uh, but it's more than just the dollar amount for us. It's really about giving back and helping other people grow their businesses. And it sounds like that's what you've been doing for twenty years. Although it may, well, I don't know. Maybe it was help yourself in that first five years. <laughs> It was, it was pay the bills at that point. You know, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you how many payrolls we had to meet. And the wife and I were like, okay, where's, what's left over for us, you know? And so <laughs> we, had, cornbread this week. Yeah, we had plenty of those where it was just like, whoa, I hope we make it, you know? So, and, well, yeah. And I think that's to any entrepreneur that has uh, advanced their career. Uh, you know, Hey, they say 60% of the cleaning business never make it to year number five. Wow. You know, and that's a huge number. So that means you're over in that 40% and now you're working into that other, other realm, but you have no idea how many entrepreneurs and how many lives you've helped along the way. Yeah, there's no, I mean, I, yeah, it's uh, the, the greatest story I ever, I love the most is I, we were just new in business. And I think it was probably the thing that really, really inspired me early on. But I had this guy named Jose working for me. I mean, we literally, I don't even think we'd hit the million dollar revenue. And he comes running in the office one day and he's waving his keys in the air like this. And he's like, thank you so much for the opportunity to work for you. I just bought my first house. And, and to me, that was one of those moments where it was like, you know what, this is what it's really about. And, you know, and I, don't, I can't even honestly tell you if I even owned my own home at that point, but I just had so much excitement and it was just that realization of this is what it's about. This is, we're here to help each other. We're here to help, you know, whether it's through mentoring, whether it's through, you know, I view us as like, we're the sales arm of, all these other janitorial companies that maybe they can't figure out the sales piece of it, or maybe they're not comfortable going on a sales call. And so that's what I think is the beauty of the subcontract model is, is that, you know, the, a lot of the subcontractors, they're great at organizing people. They're great at recruiting friends and family to help them clean buildings. They're great at executing scope of work. They're really good at working through all the processes but they just can't figure out how to sell. Maybe they don't present well, maybe, you know, for whatever reason, they just can't. And so our job is to, is to bring those opportunities to them. And, 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 you know, we strive to really negotiate like on the front end with our customers to make sure that it's a win-win for everybody. We don't want to just be like, well, we're going to charge the customer X and then we're going to pay our sub, you know, really low rate and then expect to have a good scope of work done. And we expect them to be able to actually run a business off of, you know, what we give them as an opportunity. And so for me, it's just, that's what it's about. It's, it's really amazing that we're in this industry and we have the availability to do that. So, yeah, I, I'm just thinking, you know, as you were talking there, Dan, I'm thinking, you know, I wonder how many of those some contractors still use the pictures like you did. <laughs> I bet. You know, I laugh because my AT&T guy will come to our office and, he, and, and he'll ask me about, you know, a day porter or one of the crew members. And I'll say, you know, I'll tell him, I'll say, you won't believe how many crews I have out there that still use a flip phone. You know, and, you know, they'll say, well, don't text me a picture because I can't get it on my phone or, you know, I don't have email on my phone or I have to wait till I get home to check my email. And in today's day and age, you wouldn't think that would even be a thing, but it, it definitely is. However, that be true, you know, more and more people do now have this computer in their hand, which makes everybody much more, uh, um, you know, it just it just enhances our ability to do our job to a level that we that you and I couldn't do back in those days 
No. You know, we, you know, I, I, I continually go, I wish I had a picture, but it would be before cell phones. Somebody looks at me like, what? Yeah, I was taking <laughs> Polar rides. <laughs> well, I remember, you know, on the client expectation side back in the day, it was they might page you. And then the standard was if you got back to them by like five o'clock in the afternoon, you know, it was all good and well, you know, they'd send you a page like, hey, call me or whatever. And then nowadays, it's like if a customer calls and you don't call them back within 10 minutes, it's like, what's wrong with you? What took you so long to call me back? You know, it's just a completely different expectation and, and technology has really changed that. Oh, and, and, and you know what I remember? I remember the time I stood at a fax machine and said, hurry up. <laughs> and now we don't even use a fax machine. You know, it's just like, it's, it's, but you know, so folks, I'm sorry here. Like I said, beyond clean, we talk about everything. Uh, you know, you never know where the conversation is going to go. <laughs> it, it's funny because I was dealing with a government entity the other day. It was one of the state, one of the local state entities. And they were telling me, you know, just fill out that form and, and send us, you know, send it to us via fax. And I was like, wait a minute, I haven't had a fax in like, I, I can't even remember when I had a fax machine. It's like, okay, I was like, is there an email that I could scan and, you know, email it to? And they're like, yeah, 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 you know, but it was, I was just like dumbfounded that they even had a receiving fax machine that, you know, you could actually fax. <laughs> I, I, I asked what I can do, we carry cash anymore? I carry cash, but I just do it to drive my kids crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be at, we'll be at, we'll be at a restaurant and I'll just flip open my wall and there's like a thousand dollars worth of cash in there and they're like oh can I have some of that no <laughs> no, no that's I yeah, I earned this this is mine yeah exactly so but yeah we're definitely far I, I heard some report today that I think we're at like eight percent cash versus the actual currency that's out there in the digital world that the, the actual cash just keeps dwindling away. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, you know, really at all. Well, you know, hey, it's always interesting talking to another uh, person in the cleaning industry. Um, I have some history back in over in Texas and some other stuff over there. So uh, I, I appreciate uh, where you're at. Um, some of those states where you're in, I have some uh, some common interest in some of those. And I, I appreciate the uh, the pictures. I got. I got to tell you, I, I, it's it's hard to find somebody <laughs> that you know, was doing that. Uh, yeah. And you know, and, and I think this is it. You know, I've got thousands of pictures of my computer that I've taken over, over the decades. Uh, and you know, someday I'll get them organized, but probably by then I won't care. I, I always say, you know, you're a janitor when you open up your photos and there's a picture of a toilet. Oh. <laughs> just go, if you've got an iPhone, just go to your photos and do this. We did this one day. We were just laughing at the office because we were sitting there and I said, all right, everybody go to your photos on your iPhone and in the search bar, type in the word toilet and let's see who on the team has the most pictures of the toilets. <laughs> and so I think one guy had like 400 pictures of toilets on his phone, you know, so it's like that's that's one of those, you know, when you are in an industry, when you have all of that going on. Well, I, I you know, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this question then. Have you ever had the opportunity to clean a gold plated toilet? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Have you? Yes, I have. All right. I got to hear this story. Yeah, well, let's tell you. Oh, well, there's a lot of things I could say. I mean, uh, you know, it's on a podcast here, so I'll be appropriate. Here, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, you, you think about all of the things, uh, you know, which what we started with the podcast today, all the things that we do in this industry. You know, you, you think about how would you clean a gold plated toilet? Yeah. You, you not do it the way, you know, I heard somebody talking the other day. And they were going, well, the employees won't get the pumice stone out and get rid of the, the ring inside the toilet. And I'm like, do you realize what a pumice stone is doing to the Vistra's China? Right. You should ever be using one in there. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now, if it was a gold plate, I guarantee you would. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I do have a customer that sells a $6,000 toilet. Okay. It's got, uh, let's see, it's, it's heated. It, it has motion sensors, so it, it senses when you're walking up to it. When you walk up to it, the lid opens up automatically and the neon glow light comes on. 
uh i forget it's got so many features i was we were sitting in the back just laughing because they have it in like this special room that's like showcased and you know you probably have to be pre-qualified to even go in there and look at this <laughs> toilet you know <laughs> you have your pre-qualification letter you know <laughs> do they run you through a blood type before you right. get in there <laughs> so no, but I mean, you know, that, that, that is kind of the fun, you know, it, you know, all the different places that we can go with this, Dan, it is a, an endless opportunity if we simply want to realize it. And I think that's what you, your wife, and all of the people that you work with have realized and will as you move forward. Yep. 100%. Yep. It's all about, you know, for, for me, I would say it's about painting the vision, but the team, you know, when you paint the vision, the team has to trust you. And so it's, you know, as the CEO of my organization, I'm the visionary. I'm the guy that goes out and says, all right, this is the direction we're going. This is how I see it. But you have to have buy-in from the team, you know, so to have buy-in, they have to trust you. And the way that people trust you is through a, you know, a proven track record of consistency year after year after year. And that goes back to what we were saying about taking pictures and, and being professional is just having that consistency over time. And then when the days get rough, you just push through and you just stay consistent. And then, you know, look, you'll look back in 20 years from now and you'll just be like, wow. Well, I'm gonna have to steal your quote there. You know you're a janitor if you've got <laughs> over 200 pictures of toilets on your phone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That'll be the Twitter of the day or the X or whatever they call it these days. <laughs> I, I, I'm, that's gonna have to be the title of this podcast, right? <laughs> I love it, I love it, that's awesome. <laughs> Dan, I got two questions for you before I let you go. I know that you're busy, so am I. Um, where were you born? I was born in Denver, Colorado. And we're getting ready to go into 24. So on your personal, not business, but you for Dan, Dan only, what's on your bucket list for next year? What is on my bucket list? Let's see. I, I already own three airplanes, but I've had my eyes on a particular jet for years and years. And so I would love to be able to get my dream jet this year. I just knew it was going to be a plane. I just, I just <laughs> feeling it was going to, when you, yeah. Yeah, when you said you built a plane, I'm like, I know it's going to be a plane. No, it's going to be. <laughs> so, yep, I'm constantly on the, on the classifieds looking at all these different airplanes. And so I've got my eyes on a couple of different ones, but that would be ultimate thing to be able to pull that off this year. So is that where retirement's going to take you when you can get to that point? You're just going to fly around the world? Yeah, that's the goal, just to be able to jump in the plane and say, hey, you want to go down to Cabo for the weekend or whatever? Yeah, that's the goal for sure. I, I'd say that that was a lofty goal. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> hey, it's been great having you on the show. We appreciate you coming on. You're welcome to come back anytime and give us a talk. Yeah, it was great. I enjoyed it. It was uh, great hanging out with you here for a little bit. Folks, there is a reason that I asked the two questions I did of Dan, and I do it with every podcast, with every guest. You know, the thing is, we know where Dan was born. It wasn't over there in Texas. <laughs> and we know that Plains is where he's going to go sometime next year, possibly, if it isn't in the Jets and one of those other ones that he has. We know all of that. We know what he's been doing for the last 20 years, taking pictures and cleaning toilets, right? Yeah, huh. What we don't know is where you're gonna take your future. But what we'd ask you to do is make sure that that future is healthy, positive, and proactive. Till we talk to you next time, keep it healthy, folks. <laughs>